gonna look today at uh, 1 John 4. I'm, I'm impressed that I hadn't told anyone that, and yet the uh, worship leader at the beginning knew to direct us to 1 John 4, because there's no passage in scripture that's more clear about God's nature as love. We're gonna look at 1 John 4 and read verses seven through 21. Before we read the word of God, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open our hearts so that we can understand what we are reading. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, come into our hearts and prepare us to receive this, your holy word. May this word be living and active in our lives. May it be a seed that takes root in our hearts and bears good fruit in our lives. We pray it in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the living word, amen. Hear the word of God, beloved. Let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the premise of this passage is that the love of God, and more than that, God's nature as love itself is somehow related to the love we have for other people. That's an interesting premise because it's not always obvious to us that the way we love other people is all that spiritual. I mean, some of our love is spiritual, but some of it seems to be a little bit less elevated than that. But the premise of this passage seems to be all our love. If you love, it's connected to God. So let's explore that a little bit. First of all, the passage begins with a lot of references to love. Beloved, let us love because love is from God. And God is love. And all of those words, love, are variations on the word agape. Many of you, I expect, know that in Greek there are a lot of different words for love. Maybe you've read C.S. Lewis's really fantastic book, The Four Loves. It's not the most academic exploration of the four loves, but it's certainly one of the most accessible and spiritually elevating. And anyway, you should all read everything C.S. Lewis ever wrote. So <laughs> if you haven't read The Four Loves, I recommend it to you. But there are four different words for love 
In Greek, there's eros, erotic love. There's philia, friendship. There's storge, which is affection. And then there's this more mysterious thing, there's agape. Prior to the New Testament, prior to the uh, New Testament's uh, use of Greek, the word agape was usually used to refer to a kind of favor or preference love, especially if, if it looked as if a God was showing you a lot of favor, if you seemed to be blessed. Your life was going well, you had received favor from a God, you were loved by that God. And it wasn't a word that was used as much as those other kinds of love. So what happens in the New Testament is that, I, as I see it anyway, that word agape gets filled with some more significant meaning. And it still does have that meaning that there's a God who has chosen to bless you. Because after all, that's what we all know as children of God. That God looks at you and calls you by name. Jesus says, my, my sheep know my voice, right? We, we hear God's call on our lives. We know that we have been summoned, that we've been singled out, that we're receiving blessing from him because we belong to him. And simply being identified as his is a blessing. And I think we can all agree on that, even though there are probably lots of different understandings within this room about how much you have choice in that relationship and how sovereign is God. It doesn't matter what you think about that. We can all agree what well, matters, but it doesn't matter for this point. It doesn't matter in terms of how you receive the call of God on your life. God calls you by name. He chooses to favor you. And that, I think, is the root of this idea of agape. It's not a love that you have earned. It is not a love that's based on his need. It is a love that is pure gift. And of course, that has to be the kind of love that God gives us because that's who God is. God doesn't have any need for us. When I was a, a child, my mother had this wonderful record that she used to play for us of some poetry, and there was one poem, um, and now I, I'm afraid I can't remember the author of the poem, but it was read by a man with a very deep voice. And the poem said, and God looked out over space, and he said, I'm lonely, I'll make me a world. Which is great poetry and very bad theology. Because God's not at all lonely, right? God, God doesn't need us, God wasn't lacking something, God wasn't loving us because he needed to be fulfilled. He doesn't say to us, you complete me. <laughs> no. Already in the Old Testament, we know that God is being. He's the one who names himself as the I am. And he's the creator. So we learn that if we have any being, we only have it as a gift from the one who is being. But now in the New Testament, we learn that God is also triune, that he is three in one, that he is already a society of love. He doesn't need anyone else in order to be love. The three persons of the Trinity are already completely united in love. And anything that comes beyond those three persons is overflow, it's grace, it's abundance, but it's not need. So here in the New Testament we learn that not only is God being, God is love, and so anytime we have any love in our lives, it's because God's given it to us. There's no other possible source for love than the one who is love. Just as there is no other source for existence than the one who is existence, who is being, who exists necessarily. Well, in the same way, God loves necessarily because it's his nature, it's his, it's his being. That's an astonishing claim. It means that at the root of reality, the most basic thing we know about the cosmos, the most basic thing we know about everything that exists in the world is that underneath all of it is a community of love. That, that's why everything exists. Because this community of self-giving love is so full of love that it overflowed into us. And here we are. Love is, is at the heart of reality, and that's not a sentimental thing. That's a hard truth that we have to keep coming back to over and over again, trying to make sense of it. 
So now what does this have to do with all of your relationships? That I think is what you're wondering. Because you're thinking, well, that's very nice for how I should love people that I don't really like, you know? How I should love my neighbor and do charity for them. But does that have anything at all to do with my romantic relationships? Does it have anything at all to do with my friendships? Does it have anything at all to do with the love I'm supposed to have for my parents or my siblings or my nieces or my nephews or people who are very close to me and so the people who most annoy me in life, right? Do I have any obligation to love them in this agape way? Because isn't that, isn't that not really possible for me? Well, I think what John is saying here is that yes, this kind of agapic love has something to do with every relationship you have. Of course, it's not identical to those other kinds of love. Eros is a good thing, philia is a good thing, storge is a good thing. It's good to have a romantic connection with someone, and it's good to have a deep friendship with someone, and it's good to have affection for people. But if you are a Christian, all those other relationships are supposed to be qualified and characterized and shaped by the most basic reality of your life, which is that you abide in God, and God is love. So your dwelling place, your home, your new identity, the new person that you are in Jesus, is shaped by God's nature as love. That's the environment in which you now move. It's the air which you now breathe since you are now a new creation. So it is not possible for you to have any kind of relationship that is not touched by, colored by, the sort of love that is God. Not if you're a child of God. Not if you're sharing in the abiding that is offered to you in God. John uses that kind of language here in the epistle, and he uses it in his gospel. Many of you will be thinking about that great last discourse of Jesus where he talks about how he abides with the Father, and the Father abides with him, and he and the Father together will abide with us, and we'll abide in them, and the Spirit will come to make this possible. The Spirit will join us to Jesus, testify to Jesus. So the Spirit comes to us as the the outpouring of that abiding between the Father and the Son, and then the Spirit moves in and unites us to Jesus and brings us close to Jesus, and Jesus escorts us under his protection and grace into the presence of the Father so that now we can bear to stand in the presence of the Father's glory without being incinerated, which is the great new thing of the New Testament. Throughout the whole Old Testament, people are longing to see God, to be in God's presence, to have this intimate relationship with God, and over and over they say, I can't do it. Even Moses, who, who is a friend of God, who has the best relationship with God of anyone in the Old Testament, can't really see God's face. But we can. We can have this relationship of intimacy and abiding within the triune communion. We can live in God's love. We can have a home in God's love. So it is not possible for any of your relationships to be untouched by that. Now what does that look like? Well, John tells us one thing for sure. It means that your relationships will not have any fear in them. No fear. Perfect love casts out fear. I just want you to imagine for a moment, what would your life look like if you had no fear? What if you weren't afraid of being lonely? What if you weren't afraid of disapproval? You weren't afraid of failing. You weren't afraid of conflict. You weren't afraid that your life might be meaningless. You weren't afraid of dying. You weren't afraid of getting old. You weren't afraid of being alone in the quiet and having to confront what's going on inside your own heart. You wouldn't need to conceal that from yourself with frantic activity and lots of noise. What would it be like not ever to be afraid? That's what God is offering to us because perfect love casts out fear and his love is perfect. So it doesn't mean that you being loving casts out fear, it means your abiding in the love of God casts out fear. 
The more you take up residence there, in that relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit, the more you make that your dwelling place, your lodging, the place from which you operate, the less fear there is in your life. Now what does that do to your relationships? Especially, what does that do to your romantic relationships? No fear. Well, for one thing, I think you enter into romantic relationships for better reasons if you don't have any fear. Awful lot of romantic relationships happen for very bad reasons. They happen out of a place of fear. I'm afraid of being alone. I'm afraid of disappointing my parents. I'm afraid I'm never gonna have children. I'm afraid that people will judge me. I'm afraid of what people will think if I'm by myself. They'll think I'm a failure. I'm afraid of not being popular. I'm afraid of not fitting in, not doing what's expected of me. All of these expectations and worries and concerns pile on, and then you find yourself in a relationship with someone who's not really a disciple of Jesus, not really a fit partner for you, not someone who's leading you closer to him. And why are you doing that? Because you walked into a relationship out of fear. So the first thing that happens is if you dwell in this place, if you abide in this place of perfect love, God's perfect love for you, if you know that and you trust it and you live in it, it gives you the courage to stay as you are, to remain in singleness with him until there's a godly reason to enter into a relationship. Tomorrow in chapel over in the gym, I'm gonna talk about singleness and what the New Testament has to say about singleness, how the church needs to hear that. And I, I am sorry to break it to you, you beautiful young people, but you're not all gonna get married. Uh, statistics are really clear on that. Most of you will not be getting married immediately out of college. That used to be a pattern. That's not the pattern anymore, even in Christian colleges. Age of first marriage keeps getting later and later. Many of you will wait until you're in your 30s, until you're finally married, and some of you will never be married at all. So we need to figure out how to do that and do it well and do it confidently and do it as Christians and not do it out of a spirit of failure and fear and neediness and despair. <laughs> and the first key to that, the most basic key, is to be in this place of living within the love of God to know that the love of God is perfect because see, all those things you're afraid of, you think that some other person's gonna help you with that. You think that some other person's gonna be the antidote to your loneliness or some other person is gonna give your life meaning or some other person is gonna stave off your fear of death. Well, that may happen for a few months or even a few years, but that's not a permanent solution. Eventually, every other person lets you down. The only way that you have a solution for those fears is if you're abiding in the perfect love of God. So the first thing that happens, I think, in terms of your romantic relationships is that you enter into romantic relationships for better reasons. And the second thing is that when you're in a romantic relationship, you stop trying to weigh down that relationship with every fear and need you've got. I've been reading uh, Aylred of Riveau lately. Uh, Elred of Rivo is a 12th century monk who wrote a book called Spiritual Friendship. It's a fantastic book. And Elred says when you have a spiritual friendship, a true Christian friendship, one of the marks of that is that Christ is always a third person in the relationship. Well, I think that should actually be true of all our relationships. In some ways, it's even more important in stressful relationships. I remember when I was quite young, I was having a uh, a lot of stress with a relative of mine. And I had read something, I think it was in Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I was not at that time reading Aylred, but he probably stole it from Aylred, where he talked about you have to put Jesus in between you and anyone you're having conflict with. So you, you think, as, as this person's saying horrible, hurtful things to you, Jesus is absorbing all of that. Doesn't have to touch me. And as you're saying things back, you're, you're praying, Jesus, translate what I'm saying so that it won't be hurtful, so that it will actually get through, so that, that it won't be misunderstood in, in destructive ways. And always Jesus is standing between. So I think this has to be true for all of our relationships. We, 
we stand in this place of perfect love because of our relationship with Jesus through the power of the Spirit. And we walk into other relationships still surrounded by the love of Jesus, always encased by the love of Jesus. And if you're then loving someone else who's encased by the love of Jesus, that just multiplies your love for each other. That's true in friendship and it's true in romance, it's true in marriage, it's true in all sorts of wonderful Christian relationships. But also if you're in a relationship with someone who's not a Christian and, and you're trying to reach out to that person, you need Jesus there with you. So casting out fear and, and abiding in perfect love sends you into better relationships and it colors all your relationships because Jesus is present with you. It, it keeps you from weighing down any relationship by expecting some other person to do the work that only God can do. Another thing that I think this does is it casts out neediness. Now, I'm always gonna be needy God has no need. God, God doesn't ever love me out of need. And I'm not in God's image in the sense of ever becoming like that. Sometimes we're in God's image in that we reflect God, we channel God, we show God to each other. Sometimes we're in God's image in that we're, we're cups that receive the gift God's giving. We, we have a God-shaped opening in us that he fills. And that's certainly the case with neediness. I'm never gonna become without need. I will need God for all eternity. C.S. Lewis says somewhere, can you tell I love C.S. Lewis? He says, it would be a very foolish person who went to God and said, I love you disinterestedly. No, okay. I always love God from a place of need. But because God's perfect love is filling me up, I don't have to love everyone else from a place of need. And again, this is so often a really damaging thing in our romantic relationships. It's very close to the, the problem of fear, that I'm desperately needy. In the Genesis story, uh, you remember that Adam is described as being alone in a not good way, which is kind of surprising because he has perfect sinless communion with God. So why is he alone? Why isn't God enough? And God says, well, he needs a helper. You think, well, he's got a helper. God is my help. There is no better help than God. But he needs a help who is fit for him, who is like him. Adam tells us himself what he needs. He needs one who is bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. That's what he needs. He needs God's helping presence, God's image, in someone who can be God's hands and voice and face. Someone who is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. That's, I think, the root not only of marriage but of friendship. That's what, what we're supposed to be to each other. We're supposed to be God's helping presence to each other. And of course, almost immediately that stops working. Almost immediately that falls apart. And instead of being God's helping presence to Adam, Eve brings, her, brings him a lie. And instead of being God's helping presence to Eve, Adam reinforces the lie. And they lead each other into sin instead of leading each other into obedience and faithfulness, which, is, which was the design. So, so the curse on Eve, right? The curse on Eve is your desire will be for your husband. I think that's a way of talking about that crazy neediness that historically has been especially true of women. This desperate need for a romantic partner. I will abase myself no matter how. There's, there's a character in Midsummer Night's Dream who says to the man she's pursuing, treat me as you would treat your spaniel. Which is funny until you realize how many women in history have said that to the men they love, treat me like a dog and I'll stay here with you. That's how desperately needy I am. Now traditionally men have not manifested quite that pattern of sin, it's been a different pattern, the curse is a different pattern. One of the interesting things I see in our contemporary world is that instead of helping each other get set free of our different kinds of sin, we're just communicating them to each other. 
So the kind of crazy pursuit of a career and success that was often characteristic of men, women do that now too, and this crazy desperate neediness that's willing to be abased, willing to be abused, men do that now too. This is not God's design, this is the result of sin. And when Jesus comes, we're given a power to resist that, the power of the Holy Spirit. And here in John, the power to step into this place where all of that crazy neediness is met. So that you walk into a romance not from a place of abasement, and you're not in a romance where you're being treated like someone spaniel. You're in a romantic relationship where you are together showing the face of God to each other, where you're being the helping presence of God to each other, where you're being fit, meet, help for each other, where you're saying to each other, here at last, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, God's helping presence in a human form. And if you're not in a romantic relationship, that's fine, because Jesus is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and you have him. So when your romantic partner lets you down in the help meet department, which every person will, Jesus will not. The one who is God's helping presence in human form ultimately is Jesus. He's the one toward whom that relationship in Eden was pointing. And now we have him. So that means marriage is in some ways more important because it points us to Jesus. Paul says the relationship of Jesus and the church is reflected in marriage, but in other ways it's much less important, it's not necessary anymore to be part of the full community of God because we are rooted in this abiding relationship with Jesus. Jesus is our our home now. He's the place where we dwell, we live in his love. The love that was shown to us, the love of God made visible to us in Jesus is our abiding place. And it it frees us to enter into relationships without fear, without need, and it frees us to live without all the relationships we might desire. If we could just pick up a catalog and order someone to be our friend, or to order someone to be our spouse, it's not the way it works. But we we can live with that aloneness because of this relationship of abiding. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.